Welcome to all of our podcast listeners, wherever you may be in the world today. Uh, we are so excited to welcome you. It's a privilege and honor to have our listeners with us. And today we have a very special guest with us. And from the battlefields of Iraq to the dance floors of ABC's Dancing with the Stars, he has woven a remarkable tale of resilience and triumph. The Louisiana-born Army Iraq war veteran and multifaceted talent has defied expectations at every turn, leaving an indelible mark on the worlds of entertainment, literature, and motivational speaking. Welcome, J.R. Martinez. <laughs> Thank you so much for that introduction. It's a, it's just a pleasure to be here today. <laughs> oh, I've been looking forward to it. And, and uh, first of all, so grateful for your service and all the good things that you're doing. Oh, well, thank you so much. I mean, I think it's one of the things that even though my military career was cut really short, um, I was introduced to this concept of service. And not only was I introduced to it verbally, it was explained to me, but I started to understand it and feel it. And I started to understand the role that I played in this thing we call service. And I think that was a challenge that I experienced after I was injured. And being told that I couldn't stay in the army anymore was my ability to serve was taken away. And then I, you know, over time was able to identify, no, I can continue to serve. It's going to look completely different. It's going to be in a completely different uniform. But nonetheless, I can still carry out the mission that's important to me, which is serving other people. Okay, I love it. That's a great attitude. And before we get going, I'll just give our listeners a little bit more to better appreciate what, uh, uh, you know, about your life. Uh, uh, JR comes from a multicultural background, his mom, a resilient single parent originally from El Salvador, and his dad of Mexican descent. And in 2002, uh, a young and, and uh, idealistic Martinez embarked on military training at Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, honing his skills as an 11B inf infantryman. And in January 2003, he was assigned to the 2nd Battalion 502nd Infantry Regiment of the 101st Airborne Division, which is so famous. I mean, that, that is historic. <laughs> and, uh, and in March of that year, he is deployed to Iraq. Uh, tragedy struck on April 5th, 2003, less than a month into his deployment. And while driving in the outskirts of Karbala, uh, a roadside bomb engulfed his Humvee trapping JR within, inflicting severe burns to more than 34% of his body and smoke inhalation. He was evacuated to Germany and then on to San Antonio. He spent 34 months undergoing 33 surgeries, including skin grafts and cosmetic procedures. And this terrible ordeal, however, proved to be a crucible, forging his inner strength and igniting a new purpose. So he's had the opportunity to speak to audiences all around, and he has a wonderful philosophy of adapt and overcome. That's one of his personal mantras. So let's just jump right into it. There's so many other things we could talk about, but I'd like to start off with just inviting you, JR, to tell us about your background, including any turning points in your life that's had a significant impact on you. Oh man, there's so many. I mean, it's how do you how do you pick one? I mean, I think it's I mean, there's so many that are in different stages of my life that were relevant to that time period that allowed me to get through that moment and to be able to see get to another moment and to be able to see the beauty and the lessons that come from that particular experience. But there's so many. I mean, you know, I tell you probably the most pivotal one obviously was after I was injured and you know, as you mentioned, I spent almost three years in the hospital recovering and, you know, I, I felt like I was just managing as best as I could. I mean, there were a lot of ups and downs, as you can imagine. I mean, there were days where I would be out in, in front of people in public on TV, doing interviews or do a little small speaking engagements on behalf of a nonprofit that I was representing. And, you know, yes, I put on a great front and, you know, everything was great. And I really had moments of where everything was great. But then I would go back and I would have things that would trigger me and put me in a negative space. And when I got out of the hospital, I was 22 years old and I got into what we refer to as the civilian world. And 
you know, started reaching out to people asking for opportunities. Cause at this point I identified that I wanted to be a speaker. This is what I wanted to do with my life. I, I felt like I had a gift for it and um, I felt like I could do it. I had a story to tell. And it, at the time, the story was about me, right? It was a lot about what I experienced over time. It's developed into where, you know, as someone said to me once, it was like, when your story becomes less about you and more about helping other people, that's when you're really going to start to make a difference. And, but in the early stages, it was about me because that's all I really understood about my story. And, you know, listen, I struggled. There was a lot of rejection. There was a lot of people that essentially boxed me in and just limited me to speaking to audiences in the military, which I love to do. But nonetheless, I felt like I was restricted and, and I felt like I had so much more to offer outside of the military audience. And a lot of that just, you know, listen, again, the short amount of time I was in the military, I mean, it was a, it was a culture where you got things done and, you know, you say something, you're going to do something. And I was unfortunately started to get exposed to people that would say things and they wouldn't do things. And it just really triggered me. And there was just a lot of stuff. And I was just an unpleasant, you know, 22, 23, 24 year old to be around. I mean, I was triggered a lot and I'm, I'm going to be completely transparent with you. I mean, I was in a stage of my life where I was drinking and when you mix that with this unstable, emotional individual, young man, that's not a great recipe to have. And I, I was just in a bad place. And one evening I had an altercation with, I was with a group of veterans and there was one individual that I just kind of, he and I just kind of went back and forth a little bit and I wanted to fight. That was the only thing I knew my entire life. All I knew is when something felt uncomfortable, you either run away or you fight. That's it. <laughs> there was no sense of like talking it out. There was no sense of like leaning in, like, you know, maybe crying, like none of that stuff. And uh, so I naturally just responded with, I want to fight, let's fight. And this gentleman didn't want to, he didn't fight. And what he did instead is he told me to sit in the passenger seat of his car and he told me that I needed to cry. And, and I was like, what do you mean I need to cry? And he says, you, you need to cry. He's like, you've healed physically. You've not healed emotionally or mentally. You need to cry. And as you can imagine, it just kind of took me by surprise. I was like, what are you talking about? And before you know it, I just started crying and I had no idea why I was just crying. And I just poured out a lot of things that I've been carrying, that I've been living with, that I've been struggling with over the last couple of years, frustrations. And needless to say, at the conclusion of this conversation, let me tell you how important it was and how impactful it was. Every time he and I would have an interaction over the phone or in person, when we would always say our goodbyes, he would always end with, I love you. He would say that to me. I love you. And because, again, I wasn't conditioned to tell another man nor hear another man tell me he loved me. I would respond with a typical, you know, early 20s, your 20 year old with a, all right, cool. Talk to you later, <laughs> man. Like it was just super awkward to me. And the power of this evening when I started really opening up and crying and sharing all this stuff, at the conclusion, I was the one that the first one to look at him and tell him, man, I love you. And I just said, thank you. And what I, what I identified in that moment, and as I really start to reflect on my life at that period, is that I realized that all I've, I've ever wanted and all everyone ever wants is to be listened to and not heard, right? Cause you can hear something, but not really listen to it. It's like there's background noise right now and I can hear it, but I'm not really listening to it. I couldn't repeat to you what it is that's happening behind me. But when you're actively listening, now I can repeat everything you just said to me verbatim or what someone else has said, right? And this individual, like he listened to me and he gave me a space to share and to be transparent and to be vulnerable. He didn't judge me for my quote unquote weakness. And that's what, a, unfortunately in, in the male culture and society in general, in the military community, anytime a man shows emotion, you're perceived as weak. And I recently read this article on LinkedIn as we start to ha have these conversations about mental health right in the last few years and you know you think we start to kind of cross okay now we're on the other side of this bridge but then there's an article from someone who i i think is pretty influential and pretty insightful and they are highlighting how these big you know fortune 100 companies are incorporating these soft skills into the workspace and so i read this article and what he's referring to is that a lot of these companies companies you know i know we use that they're now like investing in their people and they're listening to them and they're giving them space to, you know, explore and vent and all this stuff. And I'm, you know, thinking to myself, why does that see 
all that's great that you're highlighting the work. The problem I have with it is the title. Why is it perceived as a soft skill? Because innately soft is going to be interpreted as weak again. So here we are almost kind of taking a step back with this article, even though the intention is to highlight something incredible that society and these organizations have identified as important. You have to be willing to invest in people. And when you invest in people, despite how technology is taking over and doing a great job, and there's a lot of things that we benefit and, and makes our lives convenient from technology, but at the end of the day, it's people. And you got to understand that when you invest in people, people are going to come with things. People are going to come with things just like technology. You got to troubleshoot people. You got to troubleshoot, you know, different things that you have that you utilize. And I, I can tell you that after that incident where I had that conversation with this, with this gentleman, my life turned, my, my life completely shifted. And all of a sudden now opportunities started to present themselves. And what I took away from that was like, ah, I need, I have been over the last few years have been kind of protecting myself from truly being vulnerable. Once I lean into that, I think, okay, I think that's the secret sauce. That's where I create connection with people. That's when I, that's when we find the intersectionality between my journey and your journey, whoever you are, and we connect on a human level. And so that was such a big pivotal moment. I mean, he's, he's 17 years older than me. He's my best friend. He's like, he's like, we call him uncle Dan in the house. He's the godfather to my children. He's like, he's like their grandfather as well. He's like a dad fa father figure to me as well. Like, I mean, he's just an incredible individual that has always showed up and leaned in from a place of love. Isn't it amazing that one person, especially at the right time can have such a huge impact on our lives. Absolutely. And I think what's incredible about it is that we, we all have the ability to be that one person to somebody else. And a lot of us don't even realize it because we're so conditioned. Like, listen, here I was trying to fight this man. This is the same man I was trying to fight maybe 30 minutes before. <laughs> and he could have easily said, I want nothing to do with this kid. This kid is, is out of control. This kid is a hothead. This kid, it, like, there's something wrong with him. Go get help, right? He could have easily said those things. And that's what we typically tell people. Hey, you need to go get help. You need to go talk to somebody. Well, have we ever thought for a moment that maybe the person they would love to talk to is you? They're just probably not expressing it. Maybe they don't even realize it. Like I didn't realize it in that moment. And instead of him just kind of pushing, kicking the can down the road, if you will, and saying, let you be someone else's problem. He said, no, I'm going to lean in because this kid needs somebody right now. And I'm going to show up for him. And not only was that an example for me, but I remembered there were several instances, and I don't want to spend all the time talking about these stories, but essentially there's all these instances and experiences that I've had where I, I mean, I recently, we're so conditioned that would, you know, that we are the, that, 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 that we are always the one being asked to give. We're so conditioned that if someone approaches us, that they want something from us. Mm -hmm. If somebody wants to have a conversation, they want something. And yes, in some cases that's true, but I was, Constantly, I've been constantly reminded, and I was reminded of this just a few months ago. I was here in Austin, Texas, where I live. I done a small speaking engagement for you know some friends, and it's at this restaurant. And I leave the restaurant. It's around nine o'clock at night, and there's this courtyard. And as I'm walking out, there's a gentleman that walks up to me, and he's and he's and I'm thinking to myself, like, oh man, what is he going to ask me? <laughs> it's nine o'clock at night. Ah. Like, uh, and he walks up to me. He says, hey, excuse me, would you mind taking a picture of my girlfriend and I? And I was like, oh, oh, of course, man. Give me that phone. So I, you know, of course, do my best photography work, you know, as best as I could do. And, you know, and uh, I show him the photos and and he looks at it. He says, oh, yeah. he's like, do you mind taking one more? And at <laughs> that point, I become a little agitated because I'm like, man, I just gave you like 40. I gave you a photo album and now you want one more. But OK, no big deal. And I said, well, since we're going to take one more photo, let's just change the backdrop. Let's move you guys over here. And I really get into this whole photography thing. And so I noticed that his behavior is a little odd. Like he's almost like kind of kind of nervously, like you know, just kind of moving. And then suddenly I see him reach in his pocket and I'm like, is he about to propose? So I flip <laughs> from photo to video and I start recording. And sure enough, he does. So he proposes, I capture this moment on their phone. 
And, and of course, you know, I'm like, congratulations. That is awesome. You like, we wish you guys the best. And I start to walk away. Well, then I turn, I was like, I got to go back. I, and so I go back and I said, can I take a video with you guys? Do like a selfie video and just, you know, like, Hey, this is what I, you know, what I just experienced. And, and they were like, of course. So I take a video, I, I end the video and, and I said, Hey, again, congratulations. Wish you guys the best. And he looks at me, he says, man, we've been walking around all day. He says, and I, I was just waiting for the right person <laughs> to capture the moment. And I just thought to myself, you know, here I am. Yes, I'm the one that held the phone. I'm the one that hit record. I'm the one that took the pictures. I'm the one that captured this special moment for them that hopefully they'll be able to look back and reflect on for the rest of their lives with joy and happiness. And yes, although I was the one that gave something, did something for them, at the end of the day, I was willing to put myself in a space and I was humbled and reminded that not every interaction is intended for me to have to give something to somebody else. It's an opportunity for that circumstance, individual, whatever it happens, for, for me to receive. And I have to be on be open to receiving as well. I can't be just conditioned that I have to give because had I been just conditioned with that, I could have ended that interaction and never got that beautiful reminder that, hey, this is a beautiful opportunity to just exchange energies. And, um, and so, you know, that's what my life consists of is just really being open and listening and staying curious and wanting to know more and wanting to ask as many questions as I can as someone who is considered a thought leader or, or influencer or whatever term that is being thrown out there in the world. I think a very big part of that is never necessarily, I mean, there's a component of where, yes, I know what I know, and I'm successful because I have been the person that has made certain decisions that I've shown up a certain way. But at a certain point, you also equally need to like, okay, let me step back. Let me pause. Maybe it's a time for me to listen. Maybe it's a time for me to give the microphone to other people, even if it's people that I perceive as lower than me, whatever that means, but lower than me, they're going to be somebody that's going to give me something that I need in this very important moment in my life, whether I realize it or not. You know, JR, there are dynamics that happen just as you've been describing. Uh, you've given two wonderful examples uh, that are magical. They're special. They change things. And we're never quite the same again. Uh, I'm interested in, uh, in your reflection and experience uh, on two aspects of this really very special interchange you had with your friend. I'm not sure if his name was Dan, but... Uh, it is at, yeah. at any it's rate, uh, uh, one, first of all, he didn't fight. Uh, <laughs> I love that. And second, he said, you need to cry. I mean, what would ever cause him to say that? And second is that you were open to that. Something happened in your heart and it was life changing for both of you. So can you describe what happened? What allowed you to be open to his feelings, a suggestion, and I'm just wondering what caused him to even say that in the first place. And do you have any reflections or thoughts on that? Because maybe all of us need that in a little way uh, as we think about our lives. I think, I think the, the, I think the, a good way to lean into this is what you, the, the last sentence you just said, as we think about our lives. And the reason I think that's important to pay attention to is because we don't spend enough time stopping to think and reflect on our lives. Right. We're so conditioned. Right. The saying is like, never look back, never look back. Always look ahead. Plan six months from now. Have six years from now figured out. Have the rest of your life figured out. Right. And although, yes, that's great and that's important. And I completely understand that sentiment. I do believe and I'm one of those individuals that do believe that it is important to every, every now and then, every now and then to have these little moments where you stop and you reflect and you look back and you just appreciate the journey. You appreciate how far you've come. You remind yourself that you're incredible, that you're resilient, that you're capable, that you've already done these very difficult things. And I think the more that we do that, every situation after that, we can come to it with this understanding that I'm capable. And so the reason I say that is because Dan, Dan had had a couple people that had done this for him in his life. Mm -hmm. Again, he was 17 years older than he's 17 years older than me. So he's a, he's almost a 40 year old man at the time of this interaction. So he has had some experience and he can reflect and understand what that did for him and how it helped him. Mm. So he says, I'm going to now share that with somebody else. Right. And I think 
as far as why why I decided to accept that invitation to cry and to be vulnerable in that space when I knew the man, but I didn't really know him like that. I think, you know, when people say, you know, it, it's all about a feeling. It, it, it truly is about a feeling. Like he, he, it's easy to say to somebody, Hey, you know, you need to learn about being vulnerable. You should be vulnerable. Hey, go listen to this podcast. You know, right. They talk about vulnerability or, Hey, you need to be vulnerable. Hey, go read this book, right. Learn about vulnerability. But I think it's one thing when someone is able to create a space where it feels safe and you feel it, that is different, right? And I've been in a lot of spaces with people, whether it's one, two, 10, 1,500, 30,000 people, whatever it is, and you can, you understand a space, the energy, it feels good. It doesn't feel good. And I felt like this was a safe space where I can 100% lean in. And I just felt that this man was pure and he was coming from a, a healthy place. But I was also willing at that time to just take that risk. What else did I have? I was already, I felt like my back was up against the wall and there was no way out of whatever circumstance that I felt like I was in. And so I might as well just lean into this. And that is essentially has been the foundation of how I approach everything in life, whether it's been the opportunity to become a speaker, whether it's the opportunity to do, to cross into the entertainment space, the, to write a book, to, you know, do all the things that I've had this incredible honor to do. I just always approach it with this aspect of lean in. You never know. You'll be surprised and good things will come from it. But again, if you don't, you will never know. Good. Okay. Well, let's uh, shift uh, kind of focus a little bit here. You have accomplished so much. And I mean, really kudos dancing with the stars. Oh my heck, you, you've got some moves, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny when I went on that show, I was always the guy, I, you know, there's a couple stories and, and, you know, when people say, people ask me all the time, how did you get from this to that? Right? Like, how did you go from the military to now? going into the entertainment space, but let alone dancing with the stars and not only being able to dance, but also like winning the competition. <laughs> and I tell people, I was like, you know, when you really understand my journey in my life, it's really not that difficult to understand. I said, because, and I'll just tell you, share two quick stories. Like I already know I'm going to be that, that old man one day that's going to, somebody's going to ask me a very simple question about like, um, can you tell me do I go left or right at this intersection? And I'm like, well, let me tell you a story. Like I'm, I'm already that person now. <laughs> like I'm already like full of stories. And, but there's two stories that I think will kind of lead up to me being on Dancing with the Stars. So when I was a kid, uh, my, mo my mother, you know, my father wasn't in my life. He left when I was a child. And so my mother was dating this man and he would sing, he would sit in the living room and play these, the piano and sing these Spanish love songs. And Spanish was my first language. And so here I am as a, you know, three, four year old and I would, you know, five year old and I would sit there and I would watch and I'd be mesmerized by this man playing the piano and singing. And then I got a little bit older and, you know, and I would go over and, 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 and I would sit next to him and watch him. And then I would start singing myself and he would go, cause I was born in Louisiana and he would go to this really small hole in the wall bar and perform. And he, he took me a couple times. <laughs> and he took me to this bar, which is probably why him and my mother didn't last, but he took me to this bar and he sit there playing the piano and I'm singing. He gives me the microphone and I'm out in front dancing and singing in front of all of these people that are, I mean, who knows how many drinks they've had in their system, but they're like, Oh my God, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Whatever. And the reason I share that story is because I believe someone said this to me recently. He said, that your the environments that you're in can change your DNA. And as I someone said that to me, I it really I it processed and I was like, Oh, yes, I 100% agree with that. Because my DNA has always said this is who JR is. JR is a performer. JR has no problem being in front of people. Yeah. That is who he is. He is this this sort of this light and this energy that needs to be shared. When I was a senior in high school, we had a, one of our school dances and the principal, she was, she was, she was tough and intimidating. And she, I'm five, nine, I think she was five, 10. And, you know, she was just an intimidating woman. And, uh, let alone her name was Dr. Youngblood. And he's like, Oh my God. Um, and I remember in this dance, 
we were, you know, she was walking around, you know, like, like just watching everybody and just making sure everybody was, wasn't doing anything inappropriate and that we were all behaving. And she came around and she says, you know, okay, we only have X amount of time left. And I said, Dr. Young, like, can we, can, can we, can we like 15 more minutes? Can we stay 15 more minutes? No, no, no. <laughs> so then I took it upon myself to create this circle. And so I create this circle and I start pulling people, different, you know, peers, you know, um, classmates into the circle. We're all having a good time. We're just dancing. Well, what do I do? JR goes and grabs <laughs> the principal who's standing right there to make sure we're all dancing appropriately and behaving. I pull her into the circle and I start dancing with the principal and everyone's like, Oh, like, Oh my God. Well, guess what? Not only do we get extra time, we got an extra 15 minutes. So we were able to stay half an hour after because I got her to smile. And so the point of me telling you this is because that is always who I've been. I've always been this individual, but different circumstances over the course of my life have tried to take that away from me, right? Have tried to suppress who that person has always been. And it took some soul searching and a lot of sitting with myself and reflecting and understanding who I am and who I wanted to be to get back to that and recapture that, but then also take pride in that. And so when I went on dancing, it was no, to me, it was, and people that really have known me my entire life, it was no secret. It was no surprise that I was doing as well as I was doing. It was a surprise to everybody else that didn't know me that maybe that was the first time they were learning about me because what they saw was a title of disabled veteran, burn victim, look at someone disfigured. They focused on the disabled, on the victim, on the scars. They focused on that. And because they focus, focused on that, it blocked their ability to see what I was truly capable of and who I really am. And the more that I was on the show, it took 10 weeks. By the time I got to the end, people saw who I am and what I am and what I'm capable of. And that's how I showed up. And so for me, I've always been this person. I've always loved to dance. My mother, again, a single mother, I had no choice but to be her dance partner. She would take me to dances with her just so she could dance with me and nobody else. And I, was, of course, was embarrassed to do it as a young age. And then I realized girls like that. <laughs> so then I was like, mom, teach me a few moves. And so it was, to again, again, it was no surprise to people that have known me most of my life that I was doing what I was doing on that show. It was more of a surprise to everybody else. But what was great is that I was able, by the end of that season, I was able to remove the title of disabled veteran, remove the title of burn victim, to remove the stigma of someone who is scarred and disfigured. And instead, people looked at me and said, he's a veteran. He's a burn survivor. And JR is not someone that has scars or is disfigured. Look at him. He has, he, he can dance or he's yeah, know, wonderful. A track. <clears throat> like there's all these things that come from it. And they got to see me as a person. And that's what it's about. Well, two wonderful lessons in that one is, just don't judge people right from the, you know, from the surface. Yep. Uh, take yep. the time to really learn about people and let their magic come out. And number two, Absolutely. and number two is also realize all the goodness you have. Well, JR, I can't believe it. We're at the end of our interview already. And uh, wow. I want to give you one minute to share some of your most important life lessons that can be helpful for our listeners. I say in the midst of all the noise in our life, when there's all this chaos and a lot of things that are pulling us in different directions, and at times we feel we tend to feel overwhelmed, I just encourage you to, to pause, to close your eyes, and just to connect with your breath. And that breath should just remind you that you're alive. And as long as we're alive, we're able to show up and we're, and we're able to get the lessons that we're able to get in order to help propel us into the next phase of our life. So just pause, close your eyes, reflect, connect with your breath and understand in this moment, I'm grateful and I'm alive. Yeah. Amen. Well, what a fun interview. Bravo. It's been great. How can people find out about what you're doing, JR? Well, thank you so much for having me on. Thank you for creating this platform. And again, for having me on, it's been a pleasure. You can always go to my website, jrmartinez.com, or you can find me on social media if you're there at I am JR Martinez. Regardless, I look forward to connecting with every single person that is 
that feels inclined to reach out. If not, no big deal. It's been a pleasure to connect with you, sir. Thank you again for the opportunity. And uh, I'll be rooting for you. No, thank you so much. You're a delight and an inspiration. We wish you the best as you're touching lives for good everywhere. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. And to our listeners, uh, we're humbled by the chance to be together with you. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, I hope you picked up as much as I did today. I feel inspired and want to do better. So we wish each one of you the best. And this is Steve Schallenberger, your host, signing off.